Uh, good evening. I think we have some more lights coming up in just a moment. But uh, until then, good evening and welcome to the Warner Brothers Film Festival, the first night. Um, for the remainder of the week, we will be showing 22 films, four films each day, at 210, 410, 710, and 910. And they are a dollar for afternoon, there, thank you. Dollar for afternoon performances, two films, and a dollar and a quarter for evening performances. Now at this time, I would like to present to you our guest for this evening, Mr. Stanley Roberts. If you have read the program, you realize that his uh, writing experience covers films from John Wayne Westerns at Republic to Abbott and Costello comedies to an Academy Award nomination for Death of a Salesman. He's written Louisa. The story of Will Rogers for Warner Brothers, one of the top grossing films at that studio. He has written extensively for television and written two specials, one on musical producer Arthur Freed called Hollywood, Hollywood Melody and one on spectacle magician Cecil B. DeMille. So at this time I would like to present to you uh, Mr. Stanley Roberts. If, you're, if you would like, move down closer and uh, you're welcome to ask questions. First of all, I'd like to make a slight correction. I won the Academy nomination for the Cane Mutiny and not Death of a Salesman. Uh, but uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that there are three Warner Festivals in the Northern Hemisphere uh, as of this moment. One is in New York City, one is in Toronto, Canada, and this is the third one. <laughs> it is. Uh, I'd be pretty proud of it, really. But there's something more important than that. Yours is the only one that's in a real movie theater. Uh, the others are in the marvelous plastic confines of the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, Toronto is also using a showcase. This is a movie house. And whether you're aware of it or, or, aware of it or not, this book, which contains 1,500 titles, is the single greatest collection of films made in the United States of America. There is no comparison, none whatsoever. Now, I do not work for Warner Brothers. I'm not plugging them in any way. Uh, but these films are incredible. They are startling. Uh, and you're going to see 22 of them and, and about 16 of the best. There's just no question of it. But I'd like to go back if it, because though this is a marvelous intercutting of Warner Pictures, it doesn't really tell you anything about what Warner Brothers means and what they're about and why I, I make the outrageous statement that these are the best films. Uh, so let's go back uh, for a moment and let's go back to when this theater started. And by the way, it was the American theater, I understand. And it opened in 1918. And it had silent pictures and vaudeville. And there was an orchestra pit and you were probably watching The Perils of Pauline. Not any of you, but uh, nevertheless they were playing, and Mary Pickford was a great star and The Little American. And at about this time, four brothers, the sons of a peddler and a butcher, moved out from Youngstown, Ohio, and did my four years in Germany with uh, Ambassador Girard. They got their foot in the door, but not much more. They didn't mean anything. And during the 20s, when Metro was important, and Fox was important, and Paramount was important, they were a quickie company. They made cheap films. Yes, they had the great John Barrymore. That was the big thing. Imagine having a man who played Hamlet working for Warner Brothers. This was preposterous. They had a man named Monty Blue, uh, who was a fair actor and somehow paid some of the freight. But the biggest star that Warner Brothers had was the only actor who never complained about a script, never asked for more money, never fought with a director, and that star was Rin Tin Tin. He paid for everything, every part of it. And in case you're interested, there were also 19 Rin Tin Tins, not just one. Uh, they had a special dog for jumping over fences, a special dog for fires, a special dog for close-ups, and I assume a special dog for dialogue, except that they were 
silent pictures, but Rin Tin Tin carried this studio. And in case you're interested, I tried tonight to bring two reels of Trapped by the Police or Tracked by the Police, uh, which is remarkable. And the reason I can't bring it is it's on nitrate film. The plane would go up in smoke, and if it didn't, the theater would go up with it. But I want to point out that Lassie is a retarded child by comparison <laughs> with Rin Tin Tin. You have never seen a dog like this anywhere. He is the Albert Schweitzer of animal actors. <laughs> and to give you just a rough idea of the closing reels of the picture I couldn't bring, the heroine of the picture is suspended on a boom over thousands of miles of raging dam water. Boulder Dam looks like nothing by comparison with this. Rin Tin Tin, of course, is tied up. He fights his way out of the ropes immediately, races across the hillside, and the girl is going to drop hundreds of feet. Rinty is calm, however. He just goes out in the boom and looks around. <laughs> she could drop by the time he's through looking around. He now goes into a damn powerhouse and with his teeth starts pulling levers. How the hell he took an MIT degree, I will never know. He does. Spillway after spillway closes. It becomes as dry as the Red Sea. Rinty then goes and throws her a rope and pulls her to safety. Now, I'd also like to point out that they gave the dog a great conflict. At the same time that the girl is in trouble, his German Shepherd girlfriend is also drowning. <laughs> now, the big question is, who does he save? The leading woman of the picture or his girlfriend, the dog? Well, Warner Brothers even then knew that German Shepherds did not buy tickets. So he rescued the leading lady, and fortunately, the German Shepherd female managed to scramble to shore. Now, the dog was wonderful. But the important point was that by 1927 or 28, audiences became, or 24, 25, were becoming more sophisticated. They could actually read the titles without moving their lips for the first time. <laughs> the dog wasn't going to hold up forever. And because Warners was in such desperate financial straits, they were the first ones to see the advantage of talking pictures. They had to see it or they'd go bankrupt. It was as simple as that. And they made the deal on what we call Vitaphone. And I want you to know that even though Jolson fooled them by not singing and by ad-libbing a few lines, and they discovered they had talking pictures, they didn't expect him to talk. He was just supposed to sing. They then discovered that the exhibitors were fighting them straight across the board. Every theater owner argued talking pictures are just a fad. And as you can see, they are a fad. They haven't lasted at all. But Warners did it. And they began with the enormous Vitavon discs. And in speaking to Ray Trisdale here, the troubles with those discs were, were nightmarish. If you started the needle late, if it jumped a groove, Lionel Barrymore would read all the girls' lines, the girl would read all of Lionel Barrymore's lines, or you'd have to go back to the beginning of the reel. But talking pictures caught on regardless of the exhibitors. And as talking pictures came, we discovered what was Hollywood-like in, say, the 30s or the 40s. And there's an old joke that every lot has its plot, meaning that Metro has its story, RKO makes the same kind of picture all the time, and Warner's does too. Well, Metro, the dream factory, which is now dying, and only the last rights are necessary, was the Tiffany's. But their stories were totally unreal, completely so. Joan Crawford would always be a shop girl who would meet Clark Gable, who just happened to be running for governor. He also happened to have an insane wife. And though they met several times and so on, sooner or later his opponents would use it. And Joan Crawford would stand up with tears in her eyes and announce that she is the notorious Mrs. Moreland, but nevertheless, she and Gable haven't touched each other since real one. And of course, he was elected governor and the state went to hell. But that was Metro's picture. Uh, Norma Shearer would uh, do the constant picture in, in which her husband was cheating, whereupon she would immediately have new gowns made by a fan and flirt with somebody. The husband would immediately drop the best looking chick you ever saw and go back to Norma Shearer. This happened in eight or nine pictures. 
In between, Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy sang endlessly to each other. <laughs> and in case you're interested, by piecing McDonald's singing with track after track after track, she made Joan Sutherland look like an asthmatic on the final notes. Now, uh, at Paramount, we had Ruth Chatterton suffering with illegitimate children endlessly. Uh, Columbia made cute comedies, but only one company, only one, made pictures about the world around them. And we don't make them today, really. We don't. And I'm not doing this to pay lip service to Warner Brothers, uh, but they made the first picture about poverty, and it was a good one called Wild Boys of the Road, and it's a crime that you're not going to see it. Uh, they made the first picture about the Klan, uh, which is Black Legion. They made the first picture about unions called uh, Black Fury. The first wonderful picture about prostitution, uh, Betty Davis and Mark Woman. Uh, they, there is no subject that they were afraid of, and there is in, in the notes to the show the fact that these were superficial pictures, they were not. Uh, Emil Zola dealt with anti-Semitism. Nobody had ever done this. And in addition to this, they also wanted to make money because these pictures weren't that hot, except for the gangster pictures. And God Almighty, they own the gangster picture. They invented it, they shot up the world, and they had the best two gangsters the screen has ever seen, James Cagney and, and Humphrey Bogart. There's no question of it. And later this week, you're going to see a picture called The Roaring Twenties, which is really quite wonderful. You saw a piece of it here. And there was Busby Berkeley to take reality off the hook and give you the damnedest musical that you've ever seen. And, and in Footlight Parade, which we'll, you'll see later this week, there are four numbers that make the waterfall thing seem small. Uh, uh, and they pile one on top of another, which is very strange. Uh, in addition, they had Joey Brown. They did have romantic pictures, but it was never either a woman's studio or a studio for comedies. It just wasn't. Now, you're going to ask, well, this is the end of the major studio era. I am going back to a Hollywood, to, which is a shambles, to put it simply. Uh, Metro is closing the gates. Uh, we don't have the audience we used to have anymore. There's just no sense kidding about it. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to see this many people anywhere except in front of a television set. Uh, but life in the 30s was quite different in the 40s in Hollywood. First of all, you work for a monarchy. If you can imagine your most dogmatic, tough professor, that's what a studio boss was like. And I'm not kidding about it. They were anti-union. Uh, if you were wiped out, you were wiped out. In the case of Warner Brothers, if you got fired, you had to be off the lot that afternoon. You could not pick up pencils the following day. Actresses finished his pictures at 6 o'clock at night on a Saturday, and on Monday they reported for the next picture. There was no argument about anything. Uh, Warner Brothers also insisted on the fact that a seven-year contract was forever. If you didn't want to do a picture, they suspended you and added it to the contract. You could ultimately die under suspension. And it wasn't until the Olivia de Havilland case that that was cracked wide open. But suddenly came the war. And damn it all, we had you all trapped in these theaters. There were no television sets. You couldn't get gasoline. You didn't have anything to buy. There was no merchandise, and Hollywood boomed. It really had a fine time. Uh, we loved it. Our, we were convinced that we could show blank film and sell popcorn and make money. <laughs> there was no doubt of that either. And during that period, Warners again made remarkable pictures. You saw part of Casablanca, and not certainly the best part. Uh, you saw part of Yankee Doodle Dandy. You saw a wonderful scenes from Sergeant York, uh, Air Force. And again, they were in it. They were the only studio really with it, without being overly sentimental. And then after the war, well, my friends, then came television. The box came into the house. It was a garbage disposal unit that seemed to be running the wrong way. But it was free. Thank you. And at the risk of my neck, everything that the producers did was wrong. Everything that the studios did was inconceivably wrong. The network people who inherited television were petrified. They came from radio. 
Nobody ever had a picture of a radio show. And they offered the studios partnerships, and the studios felt this was a fad, like the exhibitors it wouldn't last. Two, they then forbade their stars to appear on television. So t television had to build its own stars, and it's an irony that Lucy, the great television star, has now come back as the star of a $10 million movie. But she was built by television, even though she had been a movie actress. Uh, they didn't lobby for tax legislation so that a star could get some degree of money out of what he made. They felt it was disgraceful to do this. And then f finally, beginning to fall on their uppers, they began to sell off this Tiffany product to television at cut rates. And in other words, they made themselves their own free competition. All of these pictures, for, for the most part, have been on television. And it's criminal that they have. Now, at the contract lists began to go. There weren't any anymore. You couldn't control actors. The great executives disappeared. The mayors, the Harry Cones, they've died. Uh, they've been taken over for the most part by ex-agents, managers. Uh, and you've got to say this about the old boys. They were tough, and they were hard, and they'd break your head if need be. But they were gamblers. When they went to the table, they put the chips down and let it ride. They weren't afraid, and they owned the candy store. It was theirs. Now there is no more candy store owner. Now even this company is owned by a conglomerate. So all I'm saying to you is, is that this is a remarkable group of films made by four brothers who were not even high school dropouts. I question whether they even were grade school dropouts. And yet they had better instincts in their rear ends than most computers at NBC have. Uh, I don't know how, I can't imagine how in 1936 somebody went to Jack Warner and said, let's do a picture about anthrax. If somebody said that to me, I'd throw them out now. But the picture is Louis Pasteur. It won all sorts of Academy Awards and uh, it made a fortune. Uh, the point that is wonderful about Jack Warner in particular is that as the years rolled on, he moved on. Bonnie and Clyde is his picture, Bullet is his picture. Uh, everybody came to the studios wearing beards. He didn't have to. He fought with them and made it go. And I have only one prayer somehow uh, at this moment that we're dealing with a segmentized audience now. Uh, the people from 18 to 29 are the only people who will get off their duffs and go to a theater. The rest say, Mother, sit down and let's watch May Maud or whatever you will. Uh, theater going is no longer a habit, uh, it's gone. Maybe someday, I don't know whether it's with cable TV, and I do hope it is, uh, we will have to go back to a system in which we made pictures on a belt line, and there was an advantage to it. For one thing, you, even the great directors like Ford, Wellman, Hawks, Curtiz, you name them, they made four pictures a year. And as crazy as the system was, it's the system that gave you the Maltese Falcon, it's the system that gave you Citizen Kane, the informer, because these guys were tough and you could fight with them. You really could. If you delivered, you could raise hell. They weren't afraid. Now we are in the grip of the managers, uh, the managers who own nothing. So all I would like to say to you is that it's wonderful because this is a real movie house with a real movie screen, and I know the orchestra is never going to come back anymore, and I don't think the vaudeville is going to come back anymore. But please, God, let's have pictures come back and if there's any question you want to ask, please ask it, and I'll try to take it from there. Anything? No questions of any kind? Yes, yes, I think that's a, a very interesting experiment. Uh, that may be the one salvation for Hollywood. Uh, with the uh, American Express, they are selling eight plays at three and a half dollars a ticket. Uh, the stars, the directors, uh, everybody involved is working for much less money and taking a percentage. Uh, if the publicity is accurate, they're going to sell out. At least they're going to sell out in the major cities and the pictures will pay for themselves. Now, I only hope that they're not photographed stage plays, because nothing you really saw tonight was a photographed play. 
Uh, if they are, then I, I, I would question it. Uh, the Iceman Cometh has been done on television and done magnificently uh, with Jason Robards and Bob Redford. Uh, I hope this is a real movie. Uh, if that's the case, then wonderful. I think that the whole subscription idea is great, but I'd rather see it about something besides plays. A novel would be wonderful, anything, but just not a static play. And I'm only guessing, I've seen nothing. Anything else, please? Why I what? We didn't. A man named Tom Wilhite and the University of Iowa chose Warner Brothers and sold them on the fact that Ames should have the festival. And I think it's wonderful. And I think that Mr. Wilhite is entitled to an enormous amount of credit. The, the uh, program he's gotten together is more professional than anything we have at the Music Center in Los Angeles. The material is wonderful. Uh, you have a pretty damn good idea of what the pictures are like. And I beg of you to see the Busby Berkeley musicals. Uh, I beg of you to see the Maltese Falcon above others. And I, I, I could go through the list because I've seen over 200 Warner movies in the last year. And I've seen them all. And uh, I could tell you this, that with what you saw tonight, we could add another 100 movies and they would be equally good. Or better, actually. But that's what... It was Tom's idea, and, and I think that Warners were very pleased that the university felt this way. I hope other universities do it. Anything else, please? I'm yeah. surprised that you feel that cable TV is the salvation for, like, uh, even dying movie uh, lives, uh, especially when cable TV seems to be of a generally lower quality than the uh, network system we have now. Well, may I amend that? I mean, pay cable TV which will not be <laughs> of the same quality. Uh, there will be heaven knows how many more channels open, and if you're going to pay for it without commercials, believe me, the quality will be just as good. It'll be better. And uh, the wonderful thing about television, the only thing wonderful, is that it devours material quickly. And that the, whereas in the palmy days, Hollywood would make about three to 400 pictures with cable TV, and with the will of God, uh, it would mean 1,000 to 1,500 pictures a year. And only a plant can guarantee delivery on time. Cable is not going to go dark. It can't. Uh, the, the modern director of today makes one picture every two years, every three years. Uh, if, if, by the way, if you talk to Betty Davis, and it's interesting, and she complains bitterly uh, about some of the conditions that one is and yet, at the other hand, she said, damn it all, I learned my business. I worked every day. I went out on PA tours. I met people. Uh, the Davis, who is remarkable in Jezebel, and, and, and you're going to, it's quite a performance, and in Dark Victory and in The Letter, uh, learned at Warner Brothers, working. They never realized they were stars, by the way, until they went to other studios, because no one made a fuss over you at Warner's, no matter who you were. So I just, when I talk of, of to come back to your point, uh, when I come back to uh, uh, TV or cable TV, I mean pay TV with a black box in the house, or I don't care how we bill you, but please pay for it. And uh, the world doesn't consist of detectives, as television would give you the impression today. There, there must be another profession. Must be somewhere. Any other questions, please? Yes, yes, there are no more publicity departments, yes. A package comes in now. Uh, in other words, a promoter uh, with a debatable knowledge of the industry uh, comes in and he's put a star together with a horse, a dog, and the director, and a budget, which, by the way, is never really quite matched. And he is given autonomy to go and make that picture. And in the meantime, the studio sits with his fingers crossed and just hopes to God that they're going to get something. They don't know. I mean, I'll give you the craziest example. Universal uh, thought in American Graffiti they were making a nostalgic picture about the 50s. They didn't know the print was delivered, that it was about the 60s. It was a slight era. It, it was a great era. It's a good picture. But uh, the other point uh, that I feel strongly is that it would be wonderful if we made pictures that reflected today more strongly. I mean, apart from the drug scene, in the way that the Warner pictures of the 30s did reflect the world around it. For a change, I'd love to see any picture in which somebody said prices were high. That would be a strange thing. There isn't any. 
Anything else, please? Yes. No, I don't. <laughs> I hope sincerely they don't, because this would padlock the last few remaining doors, and we will all be out here uh, in the feed business or something. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I would not, uh, even a picture like The Exorcist, which is a Warner Brothers movie, is cost something like $8 million. And it's too risky today to do this. Now, of course, you can say The Godfather does cost one way over. And the amount of profit you can make today, The Godfather, is preposterous and it will make well over $100 million on an investment of seven. But that's really throwing the dice. And there is no reason uh, why you need Hello Dolly, which lost its shirt, to put it mildly, uh, and uh, Star, which dropped 12 million, and all of this. Any good picture can be made for considerably less than this. And to, to, to risk this kind of money on a musical that's been around this long, I question. I don't know. I, I, I hope to God you're wrong. I don't want to see them, because I'm out of work if it happens that way. Someone else, please. How would you compare the talent of the filmmakers today to the talent, say, 20, 30 years ago? That's a good, that's a wonderful question. Thank you, yes. Uh, there is a tremendous lack of a thing called star quality today. Uh, they don't have it. Uh, if you watch Bergman and Bogart and Casablanca, you are aware of their ability to hold that camera, if need be, for two weeks. They're marvelous. Uh, Bogart is incredible. Uh, by the constant training and by the constant hammering, I find, uh, with the possible exception of Steve McQueen, uh, I find no actor today with, with, with the, the, the qualities of Cooper, of Bogart, of Cagney, who will never act again, of Grant. Uh, but these were uh, film workhorses. They had to make three pictures a year. The, the studio contract demanded it. No, uh, at the risk of being hit by... I, for instance, I, I consider Dustin Hoffman a very busy actor. Uh, I don't think that he has any of the thing that you call star quality. Uh, for instance, uh, Cooper, who may not have been the greatest actor in the world, could hold the camera forever. And Charles Lawton, who was a, a remarkable actor, said what he does is murderously hard to do. So I, I don't find uh, today's personalities anywhere near. By the way, there are better than 30 Warner stars. Uh, James Dean, Cagney, uh, Doris Day, uh, uh, Jolson, Garfield, Arliss. And they were on screen for 10 years or more as stars. Uh, I find today's stars weak tea by comparison. I really do. Uh, and I don't mean the fact that they have to be glamorous. I'm not uh, suggesting that we go back to that era. That would be foolish. But they can't hold the camera. Uh, I don't find Streisand comparable to Hepburn in the same kind of part. I just don't. And to anybody who saw Catherine Hepburn on the Dick Cavett show for two nights, that's star quality. That you don't come by easily, mannered or not. It's a good question. Anything else, please? What do you attribute Lack of continuity in making pictures now. Uh, also, to uh, the method uh, in which an actor tells you, I don't feel it. Well, you then have to explain to the actor, I didn't write you. I didn't know you when I wrote it. Uh, the actor picks and chooses his parts. He's difficult. Uh, the agent moving in between. And the fact that the actor doesn't work enough as a journeyman. Uh, the easiest example I could give you would be the English theater, where actors work in repertory, win, lose, or draw. They work in films. Uh, they work very hard. But they learn their business. This is, and, and it's impossible to do one picture and then sit it out for a year and then be any good. You don't know the camera that well. Uh, you've got to have some, I never thought of it before this moment, but the Hollywood studio system, or the dream factory, call it whatever you will, was in essence a rep show. Everybody worked. I don't mean that we worked at all times. We got laid off plenty. And if a producer went crazy and spent too much money, they shut the place down for three or four months. But by and large, it had a continuity. Now there is none. It's all gone. It's all amorphous and vague. 
uh, it may take two years to put a picture together. And then by that time, you really don't care very much about it. There's a question up there. Two of the four Warner Brothers are living today, and what are they doing? Only one. And that's Jack L. Warner, who for 50 years was in charge of production here. He left the Warners as the last Warner brother in 1968. Since that time, he's made two pictures. Uh, he's made Dirty Little Billy and he's made 1776, but none of them for Warner Brothers. Uh, he is an incredible man who, at close to 80, plays six sets of tennis every weekend. I wish I had his youth. And he's a, a very amusing man, I may add, too, but he is the only one alive. Uh, by the way, I don't know where he is, but Jack Warner's assistant is here tonight. Bill, are you here? Yeah. Would you stand up a moment? This is Bill Schaefer, who for over 30 years has been Jack Warner's assistant. And... I have a question. Yes. Yes, and Bang the Drum Slowly is a wonderful movie. I'm not making any plea for the star system. I was just asked the question of what do I think of today's personalities uh, against yesterday's. Uh, and we also went into the big cult of Lauteur theory in which the director is everything. In other words, the writer just belches and somehow he translates that into 14 reels of film. Now this is nonsense. Uh, the script doesn't exist. Somehow he just winged it. Uh, I don't believe I, I wouldn't care for any hard and fast rule that a, I, I certainly would not care to write pictures for stars endlessly. Uh, I wouldn't care to write for a director whose name appears above the film, a film by. Now, I don't know who Shakespeare's director was, but it didn't read a film by him. Uh, it, it's, it's ridiculous. I'd love to see any kind of good movie. Uh, I, I don't think the star system today will draw in the way that it used to. I don't mean that. Uh, I just meant that they were larger than life, and they were more commanding. Maybe in this, in this era we don't need people like that, I don't know. But I could watch Bogart all day and all night in almost anything. And it's unfortunate, too, that you're not gonna see Sierra Madre, which is, in which he's marvelous. And, and you're not, I beg your pardon? It certainly is, it, it is indeed. It's a great movie. Uh, uh, you will see him in the Roaring Twenties in a much more typical part. Uh, and you will see the Maltese Falcon. And I want to say to you, the picture was made in 1939, and I wouldn't change his sprocket hole right now. You can't make it any better. You can't make it. All of the casting, and there are nun stars. Uh, there's Sidney Greenstreet, uh, Peter Lorre, Mary Astor, Elisha Cook. And they're perfection. They're just marvelous, and they're not stars. All I meant is they worked, and therefore they knew what they were doing. It's great to walk onto a set with pros who don't trip over cables and fight with you all the time. Anything else? But yes? How do you feel about the animation? The future of animated films? Which kind of animated films do you mean? The X-rated animated films or Walt Disney? <laughs> I'd hate it. First of all, we don't have enough people on the screen. I mean that by that, real people. Now we're going into cartoons? In fact, even Disney's uh, films in general look to me like cartoons when he uses live actors. Uh, they're pretty frightening. Uh, and strangely enough, that's the other audience, which I forgot to mention. The perpetual child audience 
with the magic name of Walt Disney, who's been dead for a great many years now, but somehow he gets up every morning and puts his name on top of the film, which is miraculous, and they make fortunes with it. And there is never an off-color word. Nobody ever gets angry or mean in a Disney movie. It's all heaven. Uh, it's strange, but there is a market for it. Now, I'm all for uh, a good general family picture, but do they all have to be marshmallow? And please, not. Uh, and secondly, I never thought of it. If we start with animation, I'm out of work again. <laughs> you don't need that. Anything else, please? Yes. No, they wind up in the jute mills of television. And that's the te the difference is that there is, in some ways, more work. Uh, the only point is that a television show is shot in six days, and it runs 54 minutes. Uh, a good film in the 40s or 50s, uh, running, let's say, pretty close to two hours, would shoot somewhere between 40 to 50 days. Well, you begin to see the difference. Uh, there's work in television. Not much, uh, in the sense that it doesn't pay terribly well. Uh, you can get exposure, uh, but I don't know where you go from there. Now, occasionally, uh, I, I, I'd give anything if I could think of... Well, somebody just mentioned Bang the Drum slowly, and neither of those are, t uh, are established movie names, and both of them, I believe, have done some television work. It can lead to something, yes. It can. It isn't what it would be... Uh, uh, if you came to Hollywood during World War II and you weren't draftable, they would carry you over the threshold. They didn't care what you could do. Uh, we've had bomb, uh, balmy periods that are wonderful, but at the moment I would say that this is not the most ideal period to go. But I, I suppose you can say this about almost any period. I don't know what form it's going to take anymore. Uh, the irony is that you are going to see, uh, as the last film on this showing, uh, a new Warner Brothers picture, and it's called Day for Night. And it's a wonderful movie, but it's a French picture they bought. They didn't make it. Now, this is the problem. In other words, somebody's got to say, look, we're back in business again. Uh, and at the moment, Metro is out of business or going out of business, Columbia's in big straits. And we've got to find some other solution besides the clicky work that's involved in television. And most of it isn't very satisfying for a writer, an actor, or anybody. You're playing cliché. Excuse me. Yes. Well, he's done very well. Well, Clint Eastwood, he's a fluke in one sense. You must remember that Clint Eastwood was in television, and then Clint Eastwood went over and did all the spaghetti westerns. And suddenly he became a hot name on the, 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 these terrible movies. But the personality covered for him. Uh, he's made a lot of money uh, with uh, Play Misty for Me, for instance, which doesn't cost any great amount of money. Uh, he is a personality. Yes, an actor can do that today. That, uh, I think that any star of, of Eastwood's caliber can say to a studio, give me a million or a million and a half bucks, and I'll defer all of my salary for a big piece. And he's made money with it. He's done well. But I, I can't think of many others who've done it. Uh, I'd be very curious to see uh, what happens with the uh, company of artists. Uh, that's the Sidney Poitier, uh, Barbara Streisand, Dustin Hoffman, Steve McQueen, and one other, I don't remember which one, uh, because they've lost, and Paul Newman, and they've lost money on most of their pictures. They've deferred money, and they haven't done very well. Yes? Yes, 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 indeed they did. Uh, all of Bugs Bunny, and the Roadrunner, and Pepe Le Pew, and Porky the Pig, and the whole bloody deal was all Warner Brothers. Yes, yes, yes. They sure were, and they were wonderful. Is Mel Blanc still alive? Yes, sure. Is he still a voice of uh, Porky and the others? 
Yes, but uh, Warners have leased out the rights on these characters for television uh, to uh, filmation. And they will never have the full animation that you used to see on these screens. And television is a much cheaper and much less full animation setup. So uh, today what they do is record the voice first and then do the cartoon with a minimum of drawing. Uh, they will ultimately have uh, Bugs Bunny and group, a new group, on uh, CBS, I believe. It won't be the same, though. What studio is uh, bringing in the, the cash? Uh, Walt Disney, are they the biggest? Disney, uh, I can only say to you, it's, it, it's the gold lollipop, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, but the world has changed considerably <laughs> since Rented Tim's Pictures. You wouldn't believe it for a moment today. Yes, uh, they are following. They are following the same formula. Yes, yes. Uh, with Son of Flubber and the Absent-Minded Professor and all of that, yes. Is this what the audience wants? audience No, only a certain audience. No, that's the, the audience that wants to take their, their uh, children to theater. I doubt whether... Uh, members of Iowa State have seen many Disney films. I could be wrong, but I doubt it. Uh, the other studio that seems to be in fairly good shape is Universal, because they have enormous television projects in addition to the rest of it, and they have a lot of money from outside interests. Uh, as for the rest of it, I can only say you better start bailing out quickly. Uh, CBS and NBC, of course. Now, television is it. There's no sense kidding. This is a theater. It's hard to figure that it's not something you turn dials on. It's wonderful. Yes? Um, who are you most impressed with now, today, as a director? Do you believe that as a director, he's like, well, you know, like a, like a kudos for instance. You know, he, he is the main part in the movie. A lot of people go to the movies to see him. Yes, but, yes. Uh, do you believe that this is, this is necessary? Or, you know, no, I think Kubrick is a wonderful director, and he has become a draw, which I think is fine. But he's not Fellini, either. Who's a better director? Uh, no, I, I look, uh, Ingmar Bergman will sell pictures. Uh, uh, there's no question of that. But uh, look, I think Kubrick is wonderful, and, and uh, he's bright, and he's expensive to, to work with, too. But so far, it's paid off so far. Uh, all I can, uh, I, I can figure is that Kubrick in his day is no better than John Ford was in his. Uh, Certainly, he was no better than Orson Welles was in Citizen Kane, which is a remarkable movie right this moment with no changes. Uh, so all in all, uh, I don't know where we're going. I hope it's going to be a wonderful future. It, it may well be. But I beg of all of you, please, uh, see these films, all of them, uh, because and, and try to figure out what time period they belong in. It's not fair to juxtapose uh, pictures 25 years apart. Uh, the world was a different place when The Public Enemy was made. Uh, it was a different place when Casablanca was made. We were deep at war. Uh, if you can see it in its own time period and then see what really makes it go, I think you'll have a wonderful, wonderful time. And for Busby Berkeley, I think you'll have a million laughs. So if anyone else at all, and if not, we'll let Ray... Do you make a comment on the recent rash of uh, nostalgic pictures? I think that they've about run their course. I could be wrong. I think that with today's period, anybody wants to, 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 we've moved up from the nostalgia of the 30s with no known Annette or the 20s, and we've gotten to American graffiti, we're now getting nostalgic about the 60s. Uh, it's getting a bit confusing, unless you want to be nostalgic now about 1971, <laughs> which seems strange. I, I think that that's about play. I'd love to see a picture about a problem now, uh, about a real honest-to-God problem now. Uh, we're, we're living in very strange times, and the screen does not reflect them. And by going back to American graffiti, you certainly don't reflect them. So this is just my wish. I'm not running Hollywood, or whatever's left of it. But uh, as long as you'll keep coming and, and watching these things and so forth, uh, I think there may be hope. And thank you very much. I think your college is wonderful. I think that Stevens Auditorium is wonderful. <laughs>